Uh, I'm Jeff Young. I work for a public radio program called Living on Earth, and we also cover that big portion of the Earth that is covered by oceans. We try to, to do that. And I'm uh, really pleased to be here with this uh, excellent panel. I'm really excited about it, and I imagine you are too. Um, this is uh, partly about the oil spill and partly about looking beyond the oil spill and looking at the other challenges uh, that the uh, Gulf and the Gulf Coast face. And uh, I'm, I'm a journalist, and part of what we try to do in journalism is to put a face on issues. And uh, when I think of a face for this issue, I, I think of this handsome fellow right here. This is uh, Ray Reyes. He's a lifelong uh, shrimper and uh, oysterman. Lives in a little community in Plaquemines Parish, Louisiana called Grand Bayou. And uh, that's his uh, boat, the Uncle Norris, in behind him there. And uh, when I first met him, it was uh, early 2006, and uh, he and the rest of the members of Grand Bayou were still recovering from Hurricane Katrina. They had been pretty much wiped out. They live outside any levee protection. And um, he was living on the boat, the Uncle Norris, he and his whole family. And uh, I interviewed him then, and I was struck by how little he complained about his lot in life and how much he still loved the place he lived and was determined to remain there. And uh, during the oil spill, uh, I went back to Grand Bayou, and that's when I took this picture. Uh, and he had just eight months prior gotten off the boat and into a house. They lived on that boat, he and his family, almost for four years before they managed to get back in their house. And no sooner did he get into a house than he was out of a job because the oil spill, of course, had closed down shrimping grounds. Uh, he got some work, he and his son, uh, vacuuming up oil, essentially. But at the time that I last spoke with him in June, uh, he had not seen a first paycheck from the contractor for cleanup work. And uh, I've lost touch with him. I, I'm, I'm not sure how he's doing now. But when I think of uh, the issues in the Gulf, I, I think of Grand Bayou. I took a little tour of Grand Bayou. And the more I learned about the place, the more I realized this is a microcosm of the challenges that Gulf communities face. They, it's not just about an oil spill. It's about the larger impacts of extractive industries. It's about continuing to try to come back from uh, the storms. And it's about their very land slipping away from beneath them. If uh, current trends persist, Grand Bayou will be gone, mostly, by, by mid-century. And uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the coastal wetlands loss in, uh, in the Delta. Um, the figure we're given is roughly a football field every 40 minutes of land disappears. And this cuts particularly deeply for Grand Bayou because not only do they have the connections to a traditional way of life, the connections to land that so many people uh, there share, this is also a Native American community. They have burial mounds where their ancestors are, are there and you know from centuries past and they're watching them go underwater. Uh, Rosina Philippe, another member of this community, described it to me as um, a loss for which there are no words to see this happening to their community. Any one of these things that they're facing, oil spill, hurricanes, the, the coastal uh, erosion, any one of these would be an epic struggle. But people of the Gulf don't have the luxury of fighting just one battle. They have to fight all of them. And oh, by the way, they have this dead zone that creeps up off the mouth of the river, a low oxygen area, which, if I remember correctly, during the oil spill last year, grew to a size uh, roughly the state of where I now live, Massachusetts. Um, and oh, by the way, the, the river still floods <laughs> and impacts lives, as we're, as we're seeing happening right now. Um, how do you address all of these challenges? That's what I think we want to get at with this panel, and it's hard to imagine a panel better suited to address these issues. Um, really excited about who we have here. Dr. Jane Lubchenko, I don't think really needs an introduction for this crowd, but just in case you haven't heard, she's a head of NOAA. And uh, before she was a uh, head of NOAA, she was uh, already one of the most frequently cited marine scientists in uh, the literature of marine science. Uh, Admiral Thad Allen, to her right, is uh, recently retired from the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, you, you were already retired and they brought you back to, to, to do the, the oil spill work, is that correct? I 
transition to a civilian status and continue to work. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, and also was uh, directing the uh, Coast Guard's response in the wake of uh, Hurricane Katrina, you might recall. Um, a period in which, uh, as uh, Dave Helvarg once put it to me, uh, it looked like the Coast Guard was the only fully functioning branch of our government in, uh, in southern Louisiana at that time. Did heroic work. Uh, Dr. Don Bosch, uh, at the end, is a biological oceanographer. He's president of the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, author of two books, more than 90 papers on ocean and coastal ecosystem, and recently served on the Oil Spill Commission, the full name of which is National Commission on BP Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill Land Offshore Drilling. Is that, yeah, there we go. A mouthful. Um, and I should add, a, a native of Louisiana from, from New Orleans and did uh, a lot of work with uh, Lum LUMCON as well, with um, the uh, consortium of universities that uh, studies marine issues in the Gulf. So uh, we want to start with uh, five minutes of, uh, of introduction. We'll, we'll start with you, uh, Dr. Lubchenko. Thanks, Jeff. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here today. I actually was just down in New Orleans, uh, and so this, uh, that, that place, which has now a special place in my heart, uh, is very much on my mind. Um, I think it's fair to say that in the last year, since the last Blue Vision Summit, uh, there's been a huge amount that has happened. Uh, some of it very good, some of it very bad, but much of it uh, raising awareness about uh, the topic of our uh, session here today. Uh, on the good side, I would draw your attention to uh, the creation of the nation's first ever national ocean policy. Uh, signed as an executive order by President Obama last summer uh, and that says in no uncertain terms that healthy oceans matter, that it's important for the nation to be a good steward of our oceans and coasts and this is an opportunity for uh, not only the federal family to get its act together but to interact uh, in much more collaborative fashion with regions such as the Gulf of Mexico, uh, with the stakeholders in that region, with uh, the variety of voices that have interests in the region to develop collectively plans for uh, managing activities that affect oceans and coasts in a way that minimize conflicts across those uses and uh, get us to a point where we have healthy oceans and coasts. And I can think of no better example of the interconnectedness between healthy communities and healthy economies and the adjacent healthy ocean than we saw as illustrated by the devastation that was wreaked on the communities, on the people, the faces uh, that Jeff was just alluding to, and on the economies as a result of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Those connections between people and place, between the environment and the economy, uh, and between the shared responsibilities of adjacent states as well as states and federal government and local peoples for the health uh, of their oceans and coasts and therefore the health of their communities is something worth emphasizing. So in the last year, we've seen uh, both the creation of a new national ocean policy, but also uh, a, a devastating oil spill, which although not as bad as many feared it might have been, uh, was still very, very damaging to uh, the local economies, to the local peoples, uh, and whose full impact we don't yet know. Uh, there will be many years before we have a complete understanding of what the impact of the spill was, uh, especially on the long-lived species, on the ones that are hidden from sight on the seafloor, the uh, deep coral reef communities, uh, or on creatures that may have had eggs or larvae in the water column at the time. So we have yet to understand that full impact. I think it's also relevant and useful to know that before the Deepwater Horizon spill happened, the federal government had put together 
uh, a Louisiana, Mississippi Gulf Coast Ecosystem Restoration Task Force that was focused squarely on uh, working with the relevant states, in this case Louisiana and Mississippi, to try to rethink uh, what we want from management of the Mississippi River. Uh, the Mississippi River has been managed for flood control, and we're seeing that play out right now, and it has been managed for navigation, and those have been the two driving forces. As many people in the region recognize full well, it is equally important for the river to be managed to restore those wetlands that are disappearing, to restore the barrier islands, the coastal wetlands that provide habitat for many important species, that provide, as folks in New Orleans call it, speed bumps for hurricanes, absorbing the power of the storm uh, as it's coming ashore. There's recognition that we need to be thinking differently about management. There's a lot of talk about doing it. Uh, to have uh, a high-level task force uh, working with the relevant states, I think, was a very significant step forward. And as we had just completed the roadmap for how we would move ahead, uh, Deepwater Horizon happened. And of course, that consumed a huge amount of uh, activity on everyone's part. There's also um, something called the Hypoxia, Mississippi River Hypoxia Task Force uh, that has been working on ways to minimize flow of nutrients down the Mississippi River into the Gulf, creating the dead zone of which Jeff also spoke. And I mention these different things because they point to uh, the emergence of more holistic approaches to uh, ecosystems understanding that to really address the loss of wetlands, uh, to restore the uh, health of the Gulf, uh, not just because of the damage from the oil, but because of long-standing multiple other activities underway, from overfishing to nutrient pollution to climate change, all of those collectively need to be addressed in a holistic fashion. And that's the direction in which we are moving but it is very, very challenging. It's challenging because the resources are not readily there. Uh, it is challenging because the uh, different voices that uh, have different vested interests uh, don't agree on a common vision. Uh, it's challenging because there are many different federal and state laws that have to be harmonized uh, to make very substantial changes that are needed. So I'm encouraged by the fact that we have movement uh, in terms of a national ocean policy that recognizes the importance of stewardship, uh, but we have a long way to go uh, relative to uh, implementing that vision uh, and doing so in concert with uh, the relevant stakeholders, uh, each of which will continue to uh, promote a particular uh, point of view. So this panel provides us an opportunity to think about some of those interconnectedness. Um, I would say that we at NOAA, uh, even though the oil has stopped flowing, we have not stopped working. We continue to be very actively involved in assessing the damage and in crafting the restoration that is, uh, will be done in response to uh, the spill. Uh, I was very heartened that BP uh, agreed to uh, an early restoration fund. They agreed to commit a billion dollars to an early restoration fund so that we can get underway with some restoration projects. The final settlement, in whatever form that is, with the responsible parties, uh, will help provide resources for that restoration. Uh, but the restoration that comes as a result of the natural resource damage assessment process, the NERDA process, can only be used for damage caused by the spill. And as should be obvious from my earlier remarks, 
there's a lot more that needs to uh, be restored. Uh, there were problems that predated this bill. And that underscores the importance of resources to do that restoration. Now, I suspect that Don Bosch, when he speaks, may say something about the Commission's recommendation to uh, urge Congress to divert 80 percent of the Clean Water Act penalties that will be levied against the responsible parties to restoration. Mm -hmm. That would be a very useful and good source of uh, revenue to do some of that restoration that is in order. But this is a tall order. We didn't get into this overnight. We're not going to get out of it overnight. But it is timely to be having these discussions and to be thinking about how do we actually affect the changes for which there's increasing recognition uh, that we need. So with that, Good. I'll pass the baton to Admiral Allen. Those, those wee bit more than five minutes, but we'll, we'll let it pass. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. <clears throat> uh, first of all, uh, there is nothing I would change, and I wholeheartedly associate myself with uh, Jane's remarks. <laughs> what I'd like to do is maybe add a couple of comments to what she said about ocean policy. And then I think the best uh, thing I can do here is talk about some of the regulatory frameworks and what's going on in terms of uh, the interagency uh, boundary overlaps and gaps that exist in the regulatory environment out there that, that Jane alluded to. And then I'll, I'd like to talk a little bit about liability limits. And I'll turn it over to Don here. Uh, first of all, uh, Jane and I both served on the President's Interagency Task Force on Ocean Policy. Uh, there was a lot of hard work put into that. We traveled all over the country. Uh, Jane and I personally did field hearings. Uh, probably one of the most uh, noteworthy trips that we took together was in the uh, summer of 2009. In August, uh, we flew up to the North Slope of Alaska uh, with David Hayes, the Deputy Secretary of the Interior, Heather Zeichel, who's now replaced Carol Browner and the President's staff, Jay Rice, the uh, Chief of Staff at the Department of Commerce, and Nancy Sutley. It allowed us to get to know each other, and this is before the oil spill. It uh, allowed us to uh, basically forge a personal consensus regarding ocean policy and the need to move forward. And uh, I, I can't overestimate uh, the value of having a national policy and National Oceans Council. Uh, I would extend Jane's remarks on there's still work to be done and there are things that we need to do by the fact that uh, there is a marker down there to start talking about marine spatial planning. And we need to move that forward. We need to understand what that means, and we need to understand how it will be implemented moving forward. And I'm going to talk about, about why that's important now. Uh, if you look at what's currently going on in the drilling permit operation that's been resumed by the Department of Interior, both in the Gulf and now considering leases in Alaska, if you look at the natural resource damage assessment process that's going on right now, if you look at the ecosystem task force that was established under Lisa Jackson to take a look at long-term issues in the Gulf, uh, following the recommendation of Secretary Mabus's report. If you look at things like the Nook Ministerial Conference that took place in Greenland week before last with the Secretaries of State talking about issues in the Arctic, uh, all of these are positive, they're all moving forward, but in my view, none of them has acknowledged the fact that policy is in place, calls for marine spatial planning, and I guess my question is if we're going to use it and start talking about it, when are we going to do it? Uh, when you're talking about competing uses, highest best use, trying to establish what kind of science we need out there to characterize the current state. All of that plays into what we're talking about. And uh, I guess if I have a concern is we're continuing to move along in parallel paths based on everybody's authorities and jurisdictions and what they do in the regulatory process. And I think uh, we don't want to get too so far down the road that we lose the promise of what the policy called for, and that was marine spatial planning, which is going to be based on ecosystem-based uh, management and the principles that Jane alluded to moving forward. Uh, and just to give you an update on a couple of things, as you know, the absolute, uh, the, not, the, uh, the final government report on what happened uh, is being written by the joint investigation team that was impaneled by the Department of Interior and the Department of Homeland Security uh, with MMS and then BOEMRE and Coast Guard as the main components of that. Uh, that is essentially done. Uh, the Coast Guard portion of that report has been released in terms of preliminary results with recommendations. Uh, the interior portion of that remains to be published. Uh, there was a holdup related to that because they were going back and doing some additional forensic works on the blowout preventer, which is still down at the NASA Michaud facility uh, in New Orleans. Uh, the Coast Guard portion of that report addresses only the issues related to the mobile drilling unit. 
And I bring this up as a way to maybe frame the regulatory issues we need to think about moving forward. Uh, we spent the last 20 years in the Coast Guard trying to implement the provisions of Open 90. It's passed after the Exxon Valdez. That was clearly tanker-centric legislation, uh, aimed at never having another tanker accident again. And at least for 20 years, it has succeeded. Uh, while we were focused on that, uh, the drilling industry moved offshore and went way deep. Now we've got an interesting uh, set of regulatory schemes where the mobile drilling unit is regulated by the United States Coast Guard. And at the other end of the riser pipe, you have a drilling system that is regulated by the Department of Interior. It is not clear to me as a former commandant of the Coast Guard where the jurisdiction changes in the riser pipe. <laughs> uh, I had an opportunity uh, to testify before Senator Bingaman's committee last week uh, after Secretary Salazar regarding the way ahead on offshore drilling and where we need to be going. Clearly, we need to deconflict and integrate the regulatory schemes out there. So how we're, mo how we're regulating vessels that become stationary over drilling operations is integrated in how we're controlling the drilling systems. If you look at the Coast Guard report uh, from the Joint Investigative Team, there was confusion about when you have an event out there, is it the drill master or the master of the ship that needs to act when they need to act? And there was some role confusion uh, about when, who should initiate emergency breakaway procedures and things like that. Uh, I don't think those ambiguities should be allowed to exist, and I think moving forward we need to integrate those regulatory environments. Uh, I stated that in my testimony. Actually, I stated it a year ago before the science, uh, Commerce Science and Technology Committee that Jane and I both testified together at during the oil spill. And my testimony before the investigation and my testimony after the investigation was basically unchanged. So I feel that the, the, the position I took a year ago as a commandant when I was still wearing a uniform has been validated by uh, the investigation itself moving forward. The second issue is anybody that has a role in spill response needs to, re needs to review response plans. Because early on, offshore drilling was in closer to shore, and these were physical structures that didn't involve floating units, the response plans were part of a checklist that led to an issue of a permit that didn't include the review and the approval of the people that actually have to manage the oil spill. Yeah, we had, we had response plans with sea otters and walruses. Yeah, well that, yeah, and they're, for they're the addressing Gulf. that as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm familiar with that. <laughs> but the most important thing is, is to get all the sets of eyes that have to be brought to bear when you have a problem on reviewing the response plans. And that would include Noah as well, and Jane and I have, have talked about that moving forward. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time because we need to go to your questions. Uh, two quick issues. One involves limits of liability. As you know, the limits of liability right now are very, very low, $75 million. Everybody knows they need to be raised. Uh, the issue that's causing everybody a problem right now, if you raise them too high, it's impossible for the small companies that are doing oil exploration and recovery offshore to get, get, to get insurance. And the question right now is how should that be put together? Should, be, should it be some kind of a tiered process? I think there's universal agreement the, the liability limits need to be raised. The question is how far and how do you apply them uh, across the industry? And most recently, uh, I've been doing some work as part of the RAND Corporation. I'm a senior fellow there now and working with the uh, RAND Gulf, uh, Gulf States Policy Institute and the Gulf Research Institute that's been established to take advantage of the money that BP will provide over the next 10 years in terms of 